And the surgeon laughed and she said, it was in their best interest not to. You were a money-making machine for them. And so it was at that point I got really angry. I was like, wait a second. So you're telling me that this almost killed me. The disease almost killed me. And I'm an educated white woman in, in America. What is everybody else experiencing? And I was like, this system has to be changed. We need to find a better way to help women to advocate for themselves, to uh, support women. And the, the medical system here is just, it, it's messed up for lack of better terminology. Welcome to the Life on Purpose Over 40 podcast, where empowerment, elegance, and health take center stage. I'll be your guide on this thrilling journey to outshine your past self. This is a podcast all about transformation. We're plunging headfirst into exactly what health, wellness, style, relationships, and career look like as a woman over 40. You'll be hearing from all the most sought after global trailblazers and experts. This isn't just about learning. It's about embracing your inner, fierce, fabulous self. Let's get started. Hello, Amanda. It's so good to have you here. I'm so excited to have you. I'm really excited to be here as well. Thank you for asking me to be here today. Fantastic. Look, I came across you and you're in the US, I'm in Europe, and we do have a slightly different, we've got different medical systems, but I've had mm -hmm. so many issues with medical stuff going on with myself. And I came across you and I thought, oh my God, what you are doing is making such a huge difference to women. And I wish there was someone like you in Europe. I wish that you <laughs> could do that. And I think that at some stage you'll bring it across the world. But I just came across you and I thought you are so amazing and you're taking on something that I think is a huge project. So congratulations and thank you from all the women, because I know that, you know, what you do is something really special. And what I really loved was I'm going to plot the quote because I loved it so much. How I actually found you was I found your video that said, I want to burn the effing system down. <laughs> I absolutely loved that. It was just such a it was amazing. So tell me about that. What makes you say that? What is your story? How did you get here? What makes you need to help other women, not just yourself? Because I think a lot of people go out there and say, I'm going to fix everything for myself. I'll help myself. But you're helping other women. So what's your story? How did you get to this mm. situation of burning the effing system <laughs> down? Well, I recognize through my own medical journey that the system and structures that we have, particularly here in the United States, weren't set up to support us to begin with. And unfortunately, how I came to that realization is that I had gone through my own medical journey of being undiagnosed with a disease for probably about 20 years. So I have something called adenomyosis. It's a cousin of endometriosis. And long story short, my ex and I were trying to get pregnant. Um, you know, we were told everything was fine. All the numbers look good. And what they weren't looking at was my entire body. You know, they were looking at me piecemeal. And so we went through rounds of IVF. I had a few miscarriages. And fast forward to one doctor who said, oh, I think you have this disease called adenomyosis. A few things had happened that made her kind of go, wait a second, something's going on. You know, your uterus was too big for how far along you were. Um, you've had these miscarriages. You complain about these debilitating periods. I think this is what you have. And so ultimately, I ended up having to have a hysterectomy um, because uh, there's nothing they could do at this point. Oh, my Lord. adeno was diffused and it had, was starting to grow into other organs. And um, when I went for my two week post-op after the hysterectomy, my ex asked the surgeon, you know, why didn't they ever diagnose Amanda? And the surgeon laughed and she said, it was in their best interest not to. You were a money making machine for them. And so it was at that point I got really angry. I was like, wait a second. So you're telling me that this almost killed me. The disease almost killed me. And I'm an educated white woman in, in America. What is everybody else experiencing? And I was like, this system has to be changed. We need to find a better way to help women to advocate for themselves, to uh, support women. And the, the medical system here is just, it, it's messed up for lack of better terminology. Oh my God, that's terrible. I'm really sorry to hear that. That's yeah, terrible that you've been through so, so many terrible things. And uh, 
how is it that the system is so bad for women? Why is it that <laughs> they have not in all of these years made it easier for us? This is not something new. What you've gone through is you're not the first one that's gone through it and there's lots of other things. Why does it take so long for things to change? Well, I think, you know, you start to look at how people are educated here, particularly in America, in the medical system, who actually, um, who's graduating from medical school, what they're teaching them in medical school. Um, you start to look at who's getting paid. You know, you have to follow the money in America. Uh, the insurance companies are getting paid. It's even the doctors, you know, they're, they're now being given seven minutes to see a patient. And how do you even work and operate in a system that is forcing you to interact with human beings, but not take their humanity into account? You know, there's not a human centric approach. And so, you know, I think we have to come at it from multiple sides. There have to be voices out there like mine, like other women's voices um, who are saying this doesn't work for us. And, you know, if you look historically in America, how the system and structure was set up in the medical system, it, it was made, you know, by white men for white men, not for women, that's for sure. So there's a lot of different historical reasons. And, you know, we're not doing enough to say, you know, this has to stop. I mean, you would think we'd be doing more in America right now, particularly with um, death rates and childbirth for women of color. And there are people out there that are doing some great and amazing work to highlight um, what is going on and to bring community back to help support women in a multitude of ways. But it's just you know, we have to kind of go, okay, we can't eat the whole elephant. So what parts of it can we actually tackle? I've had probably worse things than this happened. So it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. I'll get into the next question. Amanda, we're getting a few problems now with our um, audio and visual, but we're making it work. So I think that if we put our heads together, we can make anything happen. So <laughs> let's try to make the audio and the visuals work properly. I will um, get into the next question because there's still so many things I want to know from you. I wanted to know, based on what you were just saying, that um, what are three areas that women most feel let down with when it comes to their health? Is there three particular that you mm. I think number one is um, being listened to and being heard. So especially here in our medical system, women are dismissed all the time. And so that feels you know, when that happens, it feels like, well, wait a second, you know, maybe this medical practitioner knows better than I do. And so not having their voices be heard. I think the other thing is, you know, having a medical team or a team of folks that um, aren't right, aren't right for you, aren't right for your healthcare plan. Um, and I think the third thing is really not knowing how to advocate for oneself. So, you know, what is it you can say? What is it you can't say? And so those are probably three areas where we focus in terms of, you know, really helping people to take back their own power and to know that they do have some choices. It's, it's harder here in America with our, the way our systems are set up and going outside of, you know, the insurance-based system. It's very, very expensive, but you do have some choices. You can always find a new doctor or a new practitioner that's going to help you, that's going to listen to you, and then also get some tools to be able to advocate for yourself and use your own voice. So what do you actually do? So period to pause, how would you help someone in that situation? Do you actually step in and talk on their behalf or do you just talk them through it? What do you do? Yeah. I mean, mainly we talk them through it or we say, you know, find somebody in your network and your support system, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a friend, a colleague, somebody who can um, take on asking the hard questions to some of your doctors and um, the medical team. Also, we tell women um, in particular to really think about what questions you want answered from your doctors. And even though they're like, we don't have time, you know, demand the time. Um, it's really important that you are heard, that you understand what they're saying. You know, there's a lot of jargon in the medical system and it's, you know, unless you've gone to medical school for years, it's really hard to know what certain terminology means. So um, right now we're not stepping in as patient advocates on their behalf. Uh, we're more equipping them to understand, oh, here's some questions you may want to ask. Um, here's uh, how you could put, you know, choose somebody in your sphere to come in and, and come to your medical appointments with you. Um, we're also pointing people to resources. So, um, you know, there's some other things, you know, we're not trying to be, uh, 
a one-stop shop for everybody. It's more about the education and pointing towards resources than anything else at this stage. Um, so there's some other things we have in the works, but um, that aren't yet out in the public domain. Uh, but right now it's really helping to equip, but, you know, with conversation guides and uh, to understand what you can ask for, um, for your own healthcare. Well, I can tell you, it's not just a thing in the US. So here in the Netherlands, yeah. um, I've had a lot of, a lot of bad situations with my healthcare and um, I'm very feisty and I say things <laughs> as I see them. And even myself, I've been in positions where I'm like, hang on a second. And um, I can imagine for someone who is not as feisty, and I think you might be a little bit like me on the feistier yeah. side that we can stand <laughs> up for ourselves. And I can only imagine the people who are not in that situation, how hard it must be for them. Because I had a doctor say to me over, I've got SIBO, so I've got um, a bit, it's extreme, like very, very extreme. And I finally found something that I thought might have actually helped after 20 years of illness. And um, she said to me, what did you read that in your little magazine? Did you in exactly that voice? Oh, and I was like, oh my God, how, like, how can you talk to something? And I said, you know, I read it in all these like best studies and I know that what I'm saying sounds crazy and I know that it might not work, but can you do a test? I'll pay for that test just to see if what I'm like, what I found out is true after 20 years of not being able to get any answers. And she just looked at me and went, what did you read that in your little magazine? Did you? And it was crushing. And I actually started screaming at her and I said to her, Oh, it's a, I, my comment was, my comeback was, thank God not all doctors are like you because then we wouldn't have found the cures for cancers that we have to this day. So I'm very glad there's not, uh, that not all doctors are like you. And she said, don't ever come back here again. And I said, don't worry, as if I ever would. And I was laughing. I'm like, as if I would ever come back and see you after how you just spoke to me. And mm -hmm. I stormed out and the whole of the waiting room was just sitting there with their jaws on the ground like, and I dealt with that and I found like I went back in to see a different doctor and I dealt with it. I actually found out that what I was talking about was true and the doctor, the mm. next doctor was happy to help me. And if I wasn't as strong and determined as I was, I would have not been now nearly completely cured. Mm. But that one doctor, I'll never forget her and her look on her face of, oh, what did you read that in your little magazine? And I was like blown away with how do you speak to your patients like this? Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's so important to equip And I'm sure these, you've heard lots of... Yeah, it's so important to equip these doctors with having some empathy and leveraging emotional intelligence when it comes to patient care. You know, of course, not all doctors are like that. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of doctors I know really did come into the field because they want to help support people. They want to help cure people. They want to treat people in a humane way. Um, however... Uh, you know, I've experienced it. Plenty of women I know have experienced that as well. And it's just, it's unacceptable. Um, and so now, especially with uh, social media, you know, we can put people on blast and, you know, it's, that's not great for their practices because we can highlight, um, here's my treatment and here's why this is not acceptable and this is not okay. And by the way, we have oftentimes as women, we have community, we have networks. We're saying, don't ever go to this doctor. This doctor's terrible. They're going to demean you. They're going to dismiss you. And it's, it's unacceptable. No. And I think that's a good thing about the power of social media. Now I think it, you know, it helps us have a voice in those ways as well. So it's fantastic. Um, the next question, I think you touched on it before and I, um, wanted to get a little bit more of an explanation from you. You mentioned something about um, uh, bioidentical hormones mm -hmm. and you said that that's actually an option for women. What is your understanding or, or more your belief about when it comes to whether it's science-based or alternative health options? Do you have sort of a... Um, an opinion on one being better than the other? Have you lost faith in the science-based mm -hmm. medicine? Do you find that alternative health is actually a better option or alternative? I don't know, in the US, do you have, because here in the Netherlands, alternative medication uh, medicine is not seen under insurance because we're based on an insurance system too here. Yeah. Um, same in Australia, it's, um, but it's a public system, but alternative therapies are not usually on the system. So when it comes to alternative health, is that something that you see is important or something that we should leave behind or? 
Yeah, I absolutely think it's important. Um, I myself sought out a bunch of alternative help, um, health help and therapists and um, uh, practitioners when I was going through the things I was going through. One of the things that really helped me to manage my pain during um, my chronic disease was acupuncture. And um, I, uh, both in, I was living in Boston before, and now I'm in San Diego. In each of those cities, I have found acupuncture practitioners who acupuncturists who are really focused on the female body and on uh, whether it's IVF, adenomyosis, endometriosis, and I found those specialists and they have been a godsend. They were also really, really helpful in helping me to ask the right questions of my doctors. And so I believe there's a time and a place and a space for each of these areas for Eastern medicine and Western medicine. Um, and no, I absolutely haven't lost faith in science. I think science um, is, you know, is key, super key um, to moving the world forward. I mean, we wouldn't have certain things we have today. We wouldn't have the opportunity for people to have um, babies in, in vitro fertilization. We wouldn't have cures for certain things if we didn't have science. So I'm absolutely a believer in both. I think part of it is, you know, being able to maybe balance both of them when you need them. Um, I'm not a firm believer in just throwing drugs at something uh, in terms of, oh, you have you know, fill in the blank. We're just going to throw drugs at it. Well, what are my other options? You know, other alternative things I could do. Is there a change in my diet? You know, we just don't look at the body this uh, holistically. Um, and so I think being able to go, okay, wait, these things all function together and what's causing some of these things and how do we not look at it piecemeal and what are my options for, uh, being able to navigate whatever I have, both with Eastern medicine and Western medicine. No, I, I, I feel about it the same way. And even with my um, bad situations, I still think that science um, is very important to helping, but doesn't always give us the solutions that we need. Um, what is your goal? Amanda, you, you know, you're constantly coming up with new solutions. You're trying to help people. What's your goal? What are you trying to achieve? Ultimately, um, I want women to take back their power. I want them to be able to leverage their voices to create change and to advocate for themselves. And I want there to be more investment in um, mainly female-led uh, health tech, femtech organizations that are solving real-world problems because it's, they're not getting solved within the system. Um, I also want to equip medical practitioners to be able to navigate patient care in a more human-centric way. So I guess that's, you know, those are my ultimate goals for this. Um, and, you know, ultimately just to create some awareness, especially here in America right now where certain voices are being silenced um, and certain issues are, you know, book banning is happening around sex ed. Um, you know, things are coming out of the classroom, which are really key to help particularly young women to navigate their bodies and to understand how their body functions. That's scary. It's super scary. And so it's like, we need to have a platform and to be able to leverage voices in a way that allows people to have access to the education they need and the resources they need to be able to get the support and the healthcare they need. Yeah, it's scary times uh, to think that when we were growing up, we were around the same age and we didn't have that greater information. Our mums didn't teach us. I don't know about your mum, but I don't know any of my friends' mums that taught um, their daughters about, you know, periods. We got the basic information of, oh, you're going to get your period and here's what you're going to do about it. But we didn't get taught, you know, when I was trying to get pregnant, the, I was nearly 40 when I was trying to get pregnant. And I, was blown away with some of the things that I was learning. I'm like, I didn't even know this. And my partner's like, you don't know about like your uterus. You don't know. I'm like, no, well, like maybe it was an Australian thing. But then I started asking people in the Netherlands, it's just something that we never, it's just part of our body and we deal with our periods. And that's pretty much all I know people to experience. And now going into menopause, it's the same sort of thing. And it's scary to think that they're trying to ban children teenagers learning anything at all like it, it's it's a very scary thing well and you know certain legislation in america right now um in florida they you can't even say period now in the classroom at a certain age so now we have oh we're not going to talk about the basics of how the female anatomy works and what's going on on a monthly basis and then we think that that's going to stop girls young girls from getting pregnant 
what? Like, I mean, it's insanity. So, you know, I'm the same as you, you know, I wasn't really equipped to understand how my body functions. It was just like, oh, there's this taboo subject. We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to touch it. Um, Ooh, it's gross. It's dirty. It's whatever. And I'm, I'm hopeful because I see some of the younger generations are embracing things about their bodies. They're embracing, um, you know, the spectrum of sexuality. They're embracing all of the things that they're going through and they're having conversations about it. Young women are having conversations about these things. Um, and that gives me some hope for, uh, making sure that these things don't get silenced, that we are not here in America going into the handmaid's tale, you know, like, which it does feel like on a daily basis. Um, but, uh, you know, these younger generations that are having the conversations really gives me hope. But the Netherlands is not much better when it comes to, I've got a stepdaughter who's 20, 19 and. I've asked her a few questions because I'm like, maybe it's an Australian thing. Maybe it's different, but they haven't been taught much more at her Mm. age. Like she finished school two years ago. They have not been taught much more than what we would have been taught. So yeah, I, I don't think it's getting better. I think thank God for TikTok, thank God for Instagram. But I think that, yeah, schools, it's not just America. I hear bad things about what's going on with the um, sex ed in the U S but it's not, not that great anywhere else so yes hopefully we get change and um talking about women over 40 what are um some pieces of advice that you have for them that they're going through major transitions at the moment whether it be still trying to get pregnant whether it's uh, menopause what is it that you can advise them on mm-hmm. i would say um number one drop the societal norms Meaning there's so much pressure that are put on all these shoulds. Women should do this. At a certain age, you should have this. At a, you should want to be a mother. That's the only reason why you have this vessel is that you should carry a baby. Drop all of that. Like I, I don't, I, I curse a lot. I won't curse on your podcast, but like, you know, F I society. Can think it out, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> like, like F society. I, so I think, I think one drop all of those ex- societal expectations. Number two, get quiet and ask yourself what you truly want for this next chapter of your life. You know, t- when I turned 40, I was like, I felt like just coming into my own. And it's a beautiful time, even if we're going through all these transitions. And then the third thing is find community, you know, find like-minded community who you can share with around what you might be experiencing right now. Um, there to support, you know, I'm going, I'm almost divorced. I'm going through a divorce and, you know, being able to have some girlfriends around me that are like, Oh, I get you. Like, I've got your back. And, and this is beautiful too. Like, congratulations. <laughs> like, you know, like Having that community of support is really, really key. Yeah, that's a really good one. I think that's, that's really true. And yeah, I, and I think based on that is having the flexibility of having different communities, not expecting Mm. to rely on one type of community, because like you said, divorce community is going to be different from like, I'm a stepmother and I talk to people that are not stepmoms. And then they look at me sometimes like, Oh, it's wouldn't be a big deal. I'm like, you have no idea what Mm. it's like. And then I talk to other stepmoms and they're like, Oh yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. So um, talking to people in that same, in going through the same thing, I think is really important and does make a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. And not relying on your partner or your husband. I think that's one thing that we always uh, like hear about is that women go, Oh yeah, my partner's going to, my husband's going to be the person, my best friend and <laughs> be everyone to me. So that's definitely a no, no. I think you agree with that. And <laughs> we can say that quite clearly. Oh. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. You're I don't. Very warm, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I don't know where we got that narrative that the person that you marry should be everything to you. Like they should be your confidant, they should be your best friend. It's like, well, there's certain things that I don't want to talk to my spouse about. You know, I would I want to talk to my entrepreneurial community or my community of girlfriends, but I don't know where that narrative has come from that the person you marry has to be everything to you that's a lot of pressure for someone too right like that's that's big yeah look I did weddings for 15 years and I took care of over 200 weddings and um I got the girls the complete opposite of your situation and um there were a lot of those women that women they were women yeah they're in their they were in their early 20s some were older but a lot of them were in their early 20s 
that I just looked at them and I thought, you're going to be divorced in five years. <laughs> like with your mentality, you're going to be divorced. Like mm -hmm. the, oh, I'm, I remember one, I'm going to stop him from doing everything that once we're married, he's, he does, I remember this one girl, he does um, a Thursday night cards or po poker with his friends. And um, as soon as we get married, he's not doing his Thursday night poker anymore. And I looked at her, I was like, why? And she's like, why? He can't do it. We're married. And then we started, like, we were talking and I found that she shops every Saturday morning with her friends and he will never stop her from going shopping with her friends on a Saturday morning because she's allowed to go shopping with her friends. I'm like, hmm, this is actually, like, do you not understand the irony of what you're saying? So, yeah, I think that that narrative of your man's going to be everything in your world is uh, interesting in that we it, come to it's, believe. It's fascinating and it's also, like, you know, I think the societal narrative that women aren't whole until they find a man and a partner is something that we, you know, at least was ingrained in me growing up that the thing that you should strive for is to get married and be a mother. Like that's your only purpose here is to do that. And I see people's identities get really yeah. tied to their spouse. And it's frightening to me, or even, you know, when people become a mother, great, congratulations, but what we no longer can be friends because I'm not talking about changing your child's nappies. Like that's your only identity. Um, it's, it's very, it's very frightening to me. And I think part of that is we have to start and the younger generations are doing this, but you know, we have to start breaking down these norms and these stories and these societal expectations that we've been taught. Um, and I think that's where, you know, when we see women coming into this next phase of their lives over 40, Sometimes if their children, if they've had children, they're empty nesters or whatever the case might be, they're lost because all they've done is tie their identity to their children. And now it's like, oh, what am I going to do? So it's, you know, I think it's really important for women to be asking themselves the questions around, you know, what does a partnership look like for me? If you should you enter one? And also, how do I start to love myself in a way that I don't actually need anybody um, to like complete me so to speak like that that rhetoric around oh he completes me it's yeah. like oh that's dangerous that's really dangerous yeah well you're not a complete person without him yeah yeah, yeah it's uh, look I travel on my own still sometimes and people say to me why don't you travel without your partner and I'm like yeah I can still travel without my partner it's yeah it's actually okay so yeah, Our very passport will travel. All, that's another conversation, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I just I saw I that just, you've traveled to fifty countries. I'm catching up with you. Right? Yeah, I was just in Europe for five weeks on my own, and um, I met friends. Like, I have some friends who live in Portugal, some friends who live in England, and but I spent the majority of the time traveling on my own. And people were gobsmacked. They're like, "What? How are you going around Europe for five weeks by yourself?" And I'm like well, how am I not? Like, isn't it empowering to be able to do what you want to do when you want to do it? It felt so good to be on this little sojourn. I had so many experiences that I wouldn't have had had I been traveling with somebody else. And so, yeah, I love it. I love it. I feel like it gives perspectives. Yeah, I, I've got to do a count again. I don't know how many countries, it's over 50 now, and I don't know the exact count, but after this last trip, I probably need to to recount and see see where I'm at. Yeah. We'll, um, we'll chat about that because I, I also thought the same. I'm like, I'm nearly at 40, but I can't remember exactly. But I have to laugh on that, what you just said, because my um, partner, I was, I'd been living in Spain and I left Spain and I just started traveling and I was about to move to Canada and I came through Amsterdam to visit some friends and was walking down one of the canals and I said, I am going to stay in Amsterdam. I'm going to buy a boat and live on a boat. And my partner and I now own a boat and we live on a boat in Amsterdam. So I actually got what I wanted. But um, we, <laughs> when I first moved here, I actually came here and decided to stay. But then I went off back to Poland to see my family. And I arranged a place to live here. And while I was arranging a place, I thought, I'll get on one of those dating apps and try to meet some guys. When I get back to Amsterdam, then I'll have some dates set up. And so I had a couple of guys lined up for dates and my partner ended up being one of them. And it was a long time until we actually met for the first time. So I think I'd been living here for about a month already when um, the first time we met. And so I'd already moved here. But whenever I tell the story, when people go, how did you end up here? I always say, yeah, I came here. And then we met and he's like, no, no, no. Tell everyone that you came here for me. 
for him, it's like the romantic, like she came here for me and I'm like, hell no, <laughs> I did not come here for you. I moved here because I moved to Spain for a guy. So I'm like, that was the story, but I'm not making up the story because that doesn't make it sound more romantic. Like to me, I'm like, no, no, no. My story is that I've moved here and I happen to meet you and you happen to be good enough to stay with. I don't need to like have some romantic story that I moved here for you. <laughs> so it's always like this funny thing in front of friends. He's always like, tell them all that you came here for me. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to tell anyone that. And then we had this like argument and people are like, now what's the truth? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes. Traveling on your own as a woman. I think so, yeah. Because you said you moved to the UK, so you were living in the UK as well. You know what it's like traveling to a different country and living in a different country. I sure do. Um, I Yeah, I lived in the UK for a decade. Uh, and I studied in Paris when I was 19 too. So I've lived in those two countries. And I really, really want to leave America and move to Europe again. So probably somewhere like Portugal. Um, and I just, you know, I feel alive when I'm in Europe. Um, I also don't conform to a lot of societal norms, American societal norms. And it just doesn't feel like this is the place for me anymore. Um, so we'll see. Stay tuned. I know that feeling. I left Australia and I signed off on the pa the paper on the way out of the country. I went, I'm not coming back. And everyone says, are you going to come back? Never. So I know that feeling of when you don't feel like where you are is the right place. And it can always change. So mm -hmm. you can always go back to the U.S. And I've got a couple more quick round questions for you. I wanted to know um, what are three things that every woman should take action on straight away? Do you have a couple of must-dos? Travel. Hmm. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I think number one, um, ask yourself what you want in this next chapter of your life. Because your story is unwritten and it's up mm. to you to create it. Number two, oh, travel for sure. Travel alone. Get some experiences alone, um, do something transformational. And then I think um, the third thing is, you know, think about uh, how there's somebody else, maybe another female or woman in your life that you can support um, and, you know, ask them how you can be helpful or, or offer how to be helpful, especially if somebody in your circle is going through something. Um, and, you know, I think we all know women that are going through something right now. And so, you know, being a support system to them because we really need it. That's really good. I like those. And what is one word that you would use to describe your future? Hmm. One. You're allowed one. <laughs> Transformational. Fantastic. And what is one of the core values or belief that has shaped your actions and your decisions in your life? Um, I think for me, it's around authenticity and being authentically who I am and trying to do that in every moment. Uh, and not letting somebody else's narrative come into how I'm making decisions, who be, who somebody else thinks I am, you know, force me to navigate my life. So I think it's really about about being true to myself and being authentic. That is such a good one. And I can say, I just, I know this is a quick round, but I think that that is something that a lot of women out there need to actually feel safe to do. I think that a lot of women don't feel safe. I'm the same. And there's been times I've been caught up in not being authentic mm. that's important to me but I do know a lot of women out there that are just not authentic so I think we should all feel safe mm -hmm. to be able to be that and not worry about other people not liking us I think mm. that yeah if you're and authentic, I think you'll find that I, I think also not place judgment on other women in that way you know how you choose to live your life um you know in Amsterdam may not be how I would choose to live my life but um, allowing space for that and saying, oh, isn't that cool? Like, isn't that such a cool lifestyle? Like, isn't that a great way to live rather than going, oh, I'm going to otherize her and take her down because, oh, can you believe that this is how she lives her life? Like, like, you know, I want people to go, oh my gosh, what can I learn from that? And how do I become a better human being by honoring that, by witnessing it, by holding space for Caroline to live her life? Like, you know, like I, that's what I, I hope other women do for one another. Um, and, you know, stopping, I, this goes into a little, I know this is a quick round, this goes into a little something else, which is when we continue to otherize each other, you know, it tears us apart, it, it forces mm -hmm. us to be divisive. 
And when women come together in a collective way, there's so much power in it. And so if we can do that for one another, I think it's beautiful. And that's how we start to create change. That's how we start to see each other do something different that gives us an idea of possibility. Yeah, I love that. It's, yeah, I think moving, you know what it's like, you've left your country and me leaving my country had a lot of people question, why on earth would you do that? Well, don't do it. I'm doing it. So I'm, <laughs> and I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what's a fun fact about you that everyone should know? I think you're mm. fun anyway. So just one fun fact. I went to wine school. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Was that in Paris? It was in London. So, yeah, I went to the WS Wine School Education Trust in London and I worked in the industry for several years. So um, it used to be my party trick to be able to pick out a wine blind. I can't do it anymore. But, uh, you know, I enjoy wine and food. They're my passions. Oh, we definitely have to meet up next time you're in Europe. (laughs) (laughs) And what is one of your passions or interests outside of work besides wine? (laughs) Well, I mean, I think we've talked about it. I have a dog, so I'm very passionate about my dog and about um, animal rights. Uh, I also love to travel. We've talked about that. So, and then reading. You know, I'm a I'm a I'm an avid reader. I read a few books a week. I really, really um, love consuming knowledge. So, those are some of my passions and cooking, cooking as well. Oh wow! And what's a book that changed your life? Gosh, so many. Probably The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. <laughs> Me too. That's mine. So, yeah. I just listened to it again the other week. I really love that book. I think that it's really very thoughtful. It makes you really think. Mm-hmm. You just provoking. you just inspired Fantastic. me to read yeah. it again. Oh, you can listen. So I just got it quickly on because I've got the book here, but I couldn't be bothered picking up. So I got it on YouTube for free. There's a video you can watch. I've watched it on double speed because, I've yeah. Because I've already had it, I've got the actual book and it's nice to read on a summer, you know, on a holiday. But just if you want to listen to it, YouTube. Mm. Good tip. And it was like uh, on Double Food, I think it was an hour and just over an hour or something like that. Amazing. All right. I'm going to do that. And I want to ask you something else because um, I did notice that you organize events around, you said in your spare time. I saw you say something about events in your spare time. First of all, what I want to know is what spare time do you have? (laughs) That's what I want to know. (laughs) Not a ton right now. Um, I'm being very intentional about where I put my time and energy and I really want, you know, my brands um, right now that I have period pause being one of them um, to really make a larger dent in the world and to bring my voice more to the fore. So um, what I do, though, is that um, I host um, I host events um, over food and wine to create community connection and change. And a lot of that's around uh, social justice or social social impact causes. And so I'll bring in speakers or interview people and then we'll support um, sometimes immigrant chefs or underrepresented, you know, people of color and then, uh, winemakers, underrepresented winemakers around the world. So, um, those are a lot of fun for me to do, uh, during the pandemic, I was doing them online. Um, and now living in San Diego, uh, I'm starting to do them in person again as well. Fantastic. Wow. I need to get you back on another day. And I think next time we get you back on here, I really want to talk to you about how you actually organize your life and get so much into your life, because I think that is something that a lot of women would love to know some tips from you. So if you'd like to come back another day, I'd love to have you. I would love to come back. I appreciate it. And I'm so sorry for our, I don't know, our glitches, our technology glitches today. You know, hopefully um, the message is fine. (laughs) It's been such a pleasure, though. So It'll thank you for. Work. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Amanda, I am so very grateful. I know that um, getting you on here and getting you away from everything else has been um, so, so um, great for me because this podcast is new and I'm so glad to be able to help women out there because I think there's a lot of women out there that need this advice. So thank you. How can people find you? Periodtopoise.com is your main website. And then you've got your firebrandinstitute.com, which is all about the corporate information as well. And they can find you on Instagram. What's your Instagram? 
at period to pause. So it's all at period to pause and stay tuned. We're going to be doing some other fun things with, uh, you can also follow me on Vino Karma if you want. Um, but those are the main places to find me. And, um, I respond to emails if you want to reach out to me. So, um, yeah, those are, those are where you can follow us and find me. Fantastic. And I'll put all of your information in the show notes as well. So Amanda, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for listening. And until next time, have a great day and keep smiling as I always say. Bye.